Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan MSP. It's Ukraine War news update, third part thereof for the 5th of April 2024. As I mentioned before, this is a massive day of news, there's so much going on and uh, that means that there's just a lot of content and it's quite long so you know you can skip through or I always advise you listen to me on 1.5 times speed so if you don't know about this go to the cog in the video below I know not all of you like doing this but you can change the speed of any YouTube video up to sort of two times the speed I do all of my YouTube listening and audiobook podcast listening at about 1.75 to two times speed um so you can do that with this and it also cuts out all my ums and ahrings. Right, we're going to start with the UN and a bit of a correction, not by me, but by the uh, the UN Ge Secretary General Spokesman, Stefan Dujaric. If you remember, yesterday I reported that he had a go at Ukraine for hitting oil refineries in Russia. And he's been challenged on that. And so he, he condemned the hitting of civilian infrastructure. But I think it might have been a lost in translation issue. So he said that he misunderstood a journalist's question when he called on Ukraine not to attack Russia's civilian infrastructure. So I presume he thought it was attacking of like apartment blocks and whatnot rather than hitting uh, oil refineries. If asked again, I would not answer in that way, he told Voice of America. That's really good news because I was kind of annoyed that the UN had taken that stance. Um, the White House has said that the US expects Russia to vote on a UN resolution to ban nuclear weapons in space. The US expects Russia to support a resolution in the UN Security Council warning countries against placing nuclear weapons in orbit. The US, uh, I mean, this sounds so kind of moonraker james bond futuristic but of course this is perfectly uh meaningful stuff to be talking about now of course it is um anyway uh, u.s national security spokesperson council spokesperson john kirby said yesterday uh, quote we have heard president vladimir putin say that russia has no intention to deploy nuclear weapons in space there should be no reason why not voting and if they do uh, then I think that should open up some really legitimate questions to Mr. Putin about his intentions and what they really are. OK, uh, so moving on, uh, Portuguese foreign minister, Portugal is no longer hesitant about Ukraine's EU membership. This is really good news. There's a new government in Portugal, and I think they previously were hesitant about Ukraine joining the EU now not so much. So the new Portuguese government is fully in support of Ukraine's EU bid. The country's foreign minister Paulo Rangel said on April the 4th presenting it as a shift from the ambiguous stance of the previous administration EU active has reported. Speaking after the NATO ministerial meeting in Brussels Rangel recognised that Antonio Costa's past government was quote totally on Ukraine's side but added that when it came to EU's enlargement quote there was at least some hesitation there which always created a margin of ambiguity so that's good news for Ukraine going forward now the challenge to Ukraine and I suggest that this is on par with the worry I have for the November election in the US actually I would say arguably this worries me more and that's pretty big because you know what my thoughts are on a new Trump term in 2024. This is something I've been talking about an awful lot. So ISW was talking about this in a report they brought out to say that in order for Russia to win on the front lines in Ukraine, which I don't think they can. I don't think they, if you've got maximalist gay intentions and objectives as, as a Russian for Ukraine to take the whole of you, for Russia to take the whole of Ukraine, or even to take, say, the whole of the south up to Transnistria, Odessa, and so on and so forth. If that's what, what Russia want, they simply cannot do it. They don't have the military ability to do it, given the level of support that the West is giving to Ukraine and will continue to give to Ukraine by all accounts, US notwithstanding. So, and this is what the ISW say, in order to win on the battlefield, Russia needs to win in the information spaces and in the political arenas around particularly Europe. They need to foment so much discord in European politics and in public discourse that the Europeans themselves vote in hardline, particularly hardline far right uh, members of the European Parliament in the upcoming June MEP elections such that the support for Ukraine within the EU dissipates, is diluted, and is is even outright challenged. This is a huge, huge worry for me. 
I, I think we are seeing the rise of the far right in Europe. But more than that, with that becomes a, a, a tendency to ultra nationalism or at least overt nationalism. And overt nationalism means you want your own nation to be to be great and therefore working federally with the eu is well there's no surprise that most far-right parties are euro skeptical parties so they want the breakup of the eu so the june elections i think you will see a rise of euro skepticism within europe and it will be amplified the voices of those parties and uh the those ideas that they promulgate will be amplified by Russia, are being amplified by Russia, have been amplified by Russia for a long time. This is part of what their information warfare is about. So this is what the Ukraine latest podcast from the Daily Telegraph, which is, you know, during Brexit was a pro-Brexit newspaper. So this is not some lefty left-leaning newspaper. This is a right-leaning newspaper that has been traditionally Eurosceptic, is talking about the worries of these elections. A new threat that is essentially facing Ukraine. So Ukraine, as we wrote, is facing a fresh existential threat this summer, but it's not from Russia. It's not from the US. It's from Europe. So a small but significant and highly vocal block of hard right far right nationalist populist what you want to call them are basically on the march across the continent and are set to perform strongly in june european elections um by the way this is i think their brussels correspondent so he's a guy that's in meeting with people around brussels the whole time so they have scored positive results in portugal the netherlands they're already in government in places like hungary finland and italy they are hard right populist are sort of at the top of polls in Austria, Belgium, and could even win the European elections in France and Poland. And basically, many of these people think Europe should no longer be sending weapons to Ukraine. They also are calling for an end to sanctions on Russia and essentially looking at ways they think that they could bring peace. So looking down the sort of the list, if you look at, Matthias Blazak, who is the chairman of Poland's uh, Law and Justice Party, and he said, look, Donald Trump is known for his expressiveness and controversial statements, but that is his way of doing politics. As president, however, he has proven that he takes US commitments to both NATO and Europe seriously. But what we do know about Trump is he has suggested he would end the war in Ukraine one way or another, whether it be through negotiations with Putin or basically forcing Ukraine to the negotiating table. Why is, it, why is this important? Because the EU has basically now outstripped the US on aid. And so I was speaking to uh, Kira Rudik, the Ukrainian MP and leader of the Liberal Opposition Holos Party. And she said, look, this is one of the reasons why we should feel really worried. She said, like, Ukraine has to do more to basically tackle the narratives that are being put out by these parties, and I'll go through a few sort of quotes in a second. Um, and she said there is a historical connection, whether it be legitimate or not, that basically she said, look, some of these far-right parties have got there are historic accusations if they've received funding from the Kremlin or at least been targeted directly by Moscow to undermine the narrative of a unified European position for in, in support of Kyiv. So if you then look at some of the countries I mentioned in Austria, Herbert Kickel, who's the uh, leader of the far-right Freedom Party of Austria, he describes his model of managing Ukraine as the same one as Hungary. Uh, so we know Viktor Orban of Hungary doesn't donate weapons, um, doesn't really want to get involved in the war, and basically doesn't really want sanctions on... He hasn't blocked sanctions, he's probably helped to water them down, but EU sanctions are in place and he backs them but he doesn't he thinks they are basically nonsense then if you look at belgium where i'm from i interviewed tom van Gerick, who is the leader of vans Belan, who are polling top of the uh, belgian national elections and for the european elections he has previously said look putin is not black or white but 50 shades of gray not in hock with putin as some nationalist leaders and he actually went as far as basically saying, look, some of his right-wing compatriots were wrong about the Russian leader because there's a lot of 
lots of sort of right wing figures who see Putin as a strong man leader, nationalistic, and as as their kind of leader. He said that Putin is a real bastard invading another sovereign country. He really did something terrible. He's not a patriot. He's an imperialist. But so. The leader of Amsterdam went on to say he believes Belgian and other Western nations should halt armed shipments to Ukraine in order to end the bloodshed. He said basically the only thing that is stopping that would stop the war is stop to halt to the Western supply of weapons because that would basically render Ukraine's fight uh, sort of yeah, it'd make it impossible. This makes me so angry. So that leader of the right wing party in Belgium, who on the one hand says, yeah, Putin is a bad guy. Yeah. And actually some of my friends who are quite pro Putin, they're wrong. He is the bad guy. But then goes on to say, but the only way we're going to stop this war is by stopping help to Ukraine. And the, the analogy is the old woman across the street getting mugged again, which is like, I could stop that old woman getting mugged by that thug who is beating her up. And I can see that the thug beating her up is the bad guy. And that's terrible. No, you shouldn't be doing that. But the only way to stop this is for me not to help and to let him beat her up and steal her purse and leave her bloody pulp body on the floor. That's the only way to stop this war and bring about peace. That Then we'll have peace. So we need to stop helping the old woman. We need to stop doing what is right and, and sue for peace. And peace is, you carry on doing what you're doing over there, guys. Oh dear, without any help, that old lady's going to get the crack kicked out of her. But we'll have peace eventually because a thug will take her purse, leave her body on the floor and then run off and spend her money. Let's allow that to happen. And by the way, we shouldn't sanction. So after the thug has run off, I don't think we should sanction that thug. We should allow him to spend that money and then just live, carry on living how he would like to live. In other words, thugs rule and we should allow bully aggressors to do what the hell they like. I freaking despise this. And this is why I am super worried about the rise of the far right in Europe. Because it's this kind of thinking that that allows for imperialism to take hold. It allows for Russia. You might give the whole rhetoric of, yeah, Putin's a bad guy, but essentially he can do what the hell he likes. This is terrible. I am super worried about June. Like, I'm more worried about the uh, the European elections in June than I am about what takes place in in November in the US. And for those of you who are prepared to write vote for these parties, and I've spoken to some of you on the threads, uh, just beware that do you know what if you, you might you might be all up for that kind of nationalism within your country but if if you are also pro ukraine you are voting for the wrong party certainly in the context of being pro ukraine it is super worrying and it is it is morally flawed it is simply that argument what that leader of the belgian far right party has said is wrong it's just morally wrong I think that's something that's sort of shared in Germany. So Maximilian Krah was looking at, he spoke about the pro-transatlantic, anti-Russian approach with the riot. And it looks like how things will be done in Ukraine and like preparing for war with Taiwan. And basically said, look, it's not really our, our thing to be like getting involved in. So that... It's not really my thing to be getting involved in when people are getting beaten up in my community. And, and... It's not really my thing to allow thugs to do what they like in kicking the crap out of old ladies, just stealing stuff. It's not my thing. It's not my thing to do that. It's, not, it's my thing to sit around and let society degenerate. That's my thing. Just look out for myself. Hey, if you attack me, I'll fight back. But you can attack anyone else. Just go and kick the crap out of them. That's fine. My thing is just, you know... Sit back and watch with some popcorn. I love watching a bit of war in my world. Man. That is what I'm, we've been writing about, and I, so I can take any questions, but I, I just think it's interesting to look at how a big election surge for the hard right, the nationalists, the patriots, as they like to call themselves, populists, whatever you want to call them, far right, could actually have repercussions on getting aid for Ukraine through. So like in the Congress, it's blocked by a group, a small group of Republicans. The bigger the right wing, conservative, hard right, far right group becomes in Europe, 
will make it harder for the EU to do business in support of Ukraine. And I'll stop there. Joe, that's fascinating. Thank you for... It's so worried. And part of the problem is it's very difficult. This is what happened with Brexit, right? Uh, and I don't want to... I'm not derailing it with Brexit, but just the idea that I think people find it harder to campaign for the status quo. So if something is is working fairly well, so the EU was working fairly well, needed some reforms here and there, but people weren't prepared to sing the praises of the EU. I remember when um, there are certain areas of the UK, I think it was Cornwall and Devon actually, who voted predominantly against uh, the EU, voted for Brexit, but they had loads of signs up around saying this whole thing was paid for by EU money and this and and they were like oh we're no longer going to get that money so after Brexit happened they're like well we're not going to get that money anymore because of course no one had actually sold the benefits of the EU adequately enough it all just became about immigration but nothing about well what does the EU actually do what are the benefits that we confer from being a member of the EU and the same needs to be done within Europe which is like okay this is the security we get. This is the unity we get. This is a trade that takes place. This is the money that you get. This is the 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 cultural benefit. This is etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And and in in the absence of that, anyone that comes up and says, "Oh, it's all freaking terrible," that thing, and then you you start being adversarial. Everyone loves a bit of oh yeah yeah. Everyone loves a bit of criticism. Everyone loves a bit of change. Like oh yeah, let's pull that down. It's easier to destroy than to create, or it's easier to destroy than to maintain. And I think that this kind of situation with campaigning and psychology and whatnot plays into uh, a more adversarial politicking and uh, you know c- this grievance narrative that many hard right parties are going to be feeding into and uh, I, and I think it, that's dangerous and I think before you know it the EU will be crumbling away and uh, and people will be like oh yeah that probably wasn't a good idea you know 20 years later it's a bit like UK at the moment it's like okay what how are all our trade deals doing oh they're rubbish oh and even the people that did the trade deals on behalf of brexiteers are admitting that they're rubbish such as the australian trade deal which is now admitted to, to be just a, a load of crack cack um so you know it's easier to promise a future with like prom- promissory notes it's much more difficult to actually i mean it shouldn't be but it just is just people aren't very good at singing the praises of the status quo and I think Ukraine will suffer as a result. This is really serious. And and if you're talking about like I please go and check my chat with Silicon Kurt and Jonathan Fink on there from the other day and we talked about the normalization of of this kind of um adversarial rhetoric and indeed the movement of the Overton window is what's now acceptable to talk about in in the public sphere that 50 years ago just wasn't acceptable to talk about. That normalisation of these very fringe views has mean that stuff like this can be said. So nothing says today's GOP like MAGA Maine state representative Laurel Laurel Libby. So she's in Maine, which is, you know, for fairly sort of moderate liberal leaning sort of place. But anyway, we have a MAGA representative asking what the Nazis did that was so bad and what did they do that was so illegal and how did they infringe on anyone's rights? Just incredible. I would like to know, although I'm not posing a question through the chair, I would like to know what they did that was illegal. I would like to know what they did, in detail if folks would like to share, that was wrong, that infringed on another person's right. Holding a rally and even holding a rally with guns is not illegal. There you go. What did the Nazis do that was so illegal? What's wrong with holding rallies with guns? What's wrong with getting like 10,000 people together with guns that are really angry about something? What could possibly go wrong? Why would we want to legislate against that? Uh, the rise of the right. Um, uh, far right, sorry. Uh, right, On with that in mind, there is a rumour that there may be a couple more House GOP resigning next week and that could shift, as I, I talked about previously, shift the, uh, the balance of power in the House of Representatives um, 
Yeah. As Thomas Kane has said, said previously, each of the House of Republicans has to decide whether to resign immediately and let the Democrats take control, or they can continue on and always be remembered for being part of the Nazi-like Republicans who tried to destroy democracy for Trump. Okay. There's a lot of rhetoric going on here, but then when you look at over, like, fascistic, uh, em empathising statements going on, uh, then it does make you wonder. But there could be an interesting shift in, in the House of Representatives. Um, now... Let's go and do so. We criticise the 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 far right. Let's criticise some in the Biden administration, and we're going to criticise particularly Jake Sullivan here because I think he is, and he's long been rumoured to be the guy who's anti-escalation, who is holding the Biden administration back from doing more than it than it is presently and has done, is presently doing and has done. So. No report says not Biden's, but Jake Sullivan's mental state should be checked. After more than two years still falling up for Putin's nuclear talk, exactly what Putin wants. What a weak spine that Sullivan is, completely detached from reality. So this is uh, referring to Colby Badwa, who yesterday says Mike McCall says that Sullivan believes that Russia will launch a first nuclear strike against the United States if Ukraine is given too much military aid. What planet is Jake Sullivan living on? So the quote from... Uh, well, from McCall originally. A lot of people have drawn uh, this distinction between Tony and Jake. What do you think is Jake's logic in this? So Jake is, he's overly cautious. He's very timid. And he's bought into this notion that, well, if we give him, them too much, then Russia's going to use a tactical nuke on us. Well, most intelligence I've seen, they're not going to do that because that would be a game changer for everybody. Of course, this is, this is a genuine uh, worry. And it's been a worry in the US political scene for 70 years right and actually it's underwritten a lot of US policy so Jake Sullivan isn't being particularly different and particularly spineless however I think he's wrong so I, I'm not trying to defend him I'm just trying to sit him in context uh, I, I I think it's a problem and it's holding back the US from doing as much as it could have done. I mean, I think Atakams could have gone way earlier. I think F-16s could have gone way earlier and it would have been the thinking of Jake Sullivan that held that back. Ivana Stradner, who's a Balkans expert, says with nuclear threats, Putin plays the West like a fiddle. It's time for Washington to see, to see through the Kremlin's psychological games. Sullivan should read this article on how Putin is reflexively... Uh, in control of the White House. Uh, and again, you know, going back to referencing McCall as well. So, yeah, Jake Sullivan is a bit of a problem. So you have the problem within the Biden administration and the problem outside of that in the GOP, in the House of Representatives, and it's uh, paying more than lip service to Donald Trump and his kind of appeasement view. So these two issues are l l meaning... The US is either at an impasse or when it is giving aid, isn't quite giving the right type of aid at the right time. Um, Jason J. Smart says the White House's refusal to supply a, with Ukraine with ATAC and F-16s, etc. is driven by Jake Sullivan's baseless fear that it would escalate the war, contradicting US intelligence reports. Sullivan led the collapse of Afghanistan and told Ukraine to stop drone strikes on in Russia so oil prices did not increase before US elections. The whole thing in Afghanistan is a whole big issue to do with the deal that was done before Biden got into. Biden had to do Afghanistan. I know it's a bit of a it was a complete disaster, but he had to do it because of the deal that was formally signed during the Trump administration. So they were fulfilling the requirements. Anyway, it, nonetheless, it, it was not done well. But it is not. It was done under Biden, but was orchestrated under Trump, and there were there were huge issues with Afghanistan. Nevertheless, I think Sullivan is a real issue, and uh, it, I'd much prefer you know Blinken to be doing Sullivan's job, for example. Uh, Olaf Schultz, likewise, quotes, Olaf Schultz's top priority seems to be to avoid an escalation of the conflict, especially a direct confrontation between NATO and Russia, writes Anna Palacio, a former foreign minister of Spain, in the guest op-ed in the Kiev Independence. So Olaf Schultz is very much in line. In fact, he toes the, the party line, it seems, with the US. He only does what the US does. Uh, you know, after the US does it and so if the, the Biden administration is afraid of escalation then he is too um, and hence Taurus uh, just something just random here this is from Robert Reich uh, 
just talking about inflation because I know that's big in the US and still big and the perceptions of the economy are not aligned with the reality of the economy and the US economy is doing really well but the US population is still lagging behind it in perceptions. But there is this thing about inflation and, and blaming inflation on say, I don't know, Biden or oil, gas prices, this and that. But memo to the media, please don't say inflation is at a 40 year high, you know, which it has been without also mentioning that corporate profits are at a 70 year high. Give people the full picture. I talked about this previously when uh, we had a situation in the UK when uh, our hydrocarbons industry, our fossil fuels industry were making record profits, our energy distribution industries were making record profits. So yeah, BP's literally telling shareholders, we've got so much money, we don't know what to do with it. Meanwhile, this is the beginning of the war, when the fuel prices, energy prices went sky skyrocketed, they said, we've got more money than we know what to do with. And then people couldn't afford energy. And we had to have um, off gen the, the uh, UK jet, um, regulator for the energy market producing a, a charity to pay people that couldn't afford to pay their energy bills. Meanwhile, BP was saying, we've got more money than we know what to do with. And British Gas and other distributors were saying, well, we're making record profits. So you're making record profits. I'll tell you what you can do with that money. You can reduce your profits and reduce the price of energy for consumers. And so there needs to be real careful talk here about like what's going on when we're complaining about inflation and yet corporate profits are at 70 year high and you get then you get the inflation wage spiral that kicks in and so you know when the economy does really well inflation goes up because everyone has money and they're spending more money but of course you know there's also something to be said about cor corporate profits that are way over and above what they necessarily need to be. And yeah, okay, we get big discussions about tax and whatnot, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. No reports. Reports that NATO uh, foreign ministers have decided to establish a NATO mission. Uh, that's coming from Sikorsky, Polish foreign minister. Quote, we decided to create a NATO mission. This does not mean that we are going to war, but it means that now we will be able to use the capabilities of the Alliance for Coordination, Preparation and Planning to Support Ukraine in a more coordinated way. So this is that move away from the US, uh, the US uh, being at the helm and NATO being at the helm of which US is a member uh, and an important member, the biggest member. But, you know, it's about future proofing against political, the political winds changing in, in the US and being able to help Ukraine in, in other ways. And there have been some, there's, there was that White House reaction against this kind of move away from US, I guess, hegemony within the defence sector. Um, and yeah, uh, I, I think that there's some interesting movements happening. NATO is discussing the possibility of admitting Ukraine to the alliance in exchange for the cession of territories to Russia. That's coming from La Repubblica, and it is not being discussed formally, but apparently this is being discussed under the radar, which is to say, uh, the way I understand it is, okay, you give Russia Crimea and the Donbass, and we will give you, NATO, you will be part of NATO straight away. And if that happens, yeah, it sucks that you've lost all of this territory, and it sucks that you've lost Crimea, formally, but, you won't lose any more because if Russia attacks any more, you will be s supported by Article 5. I don't know what you guys think about that. Let me know. I think it's unfair, but it also secures them going forward. So there is some give and take there. Although this option is not an official position, it is being discussed informally and is becoming increasingly realistic, says Nexter, especially in light of the upcoming US elections. And as the newspaper points out, Russia will be offered to retain Crimea and all the territories that were captured over the past two years. Then the borders will be fixed and Ukraine will be accepted into NATO. This scenario, according to journalists, is reminiscent of the situation after World War II when Germany was divided into eastern and western parts. The article indicates that such a scenario would speed up the release of aid to Kyiv, which is currently blocked in Congress, especially in anticipation of trans possible return to the White House. Lots of controversy you can see in that, that suggestion. Uh, the German people overwhelmingly support NATO, according to new numbers. 82% support NATO uh, in being important to preserve peace in Europe. 69% consider the military alliance with the USA to be in European interest. And only 9% think that NATO is redundant and should be dissolved. And that'll be those, uh, I guess, supporting uh, Russia in inside 
Germany. Now, going on to a, a bunch of stuff on France, I quote, I really want the Euro-Atlantic area to listen to President Emmanuel Macron and take his words seriously. And that's the words of Dmitry Kuleba, the foreign minister for Ukraine. Uh, what upsets me is that I always have to convince when everything is obvious. If a part of Europe thinks that war is not... It, is not its home. It is making a big mistake. Today, strong and regular decisions must be taken on the strengthening of the army and the possibility of Ukrainian advances on the front. So, uh, Dmitry Kuleba is very formally saying France is is on the right track here and very clearly stating what should be obvious. Um, here we have actually before we, no no we are going to get this. So. Uh, this is Benjamin Haddad saying, I've just returned from Kiev and Odessa and it's clear that we're currently in an existential turning point for Europe. Whether we say to ourselves that the Americans will no longer be there in the near future and we push Ukraine into a negotiation with Russia that's unfavourable for Ukraine, see before, with disastrous consequences for our security and a president that this will create throughout the world. Either we give ourselves as Europeans a means to take charge of our security by giving the Ukrainians everything they need to win this war and we change our software in the balance of power with Putin. We've been setting our own red lines for two years without setting any for Putin. We are waking up in Europe and turning the tables. This is absolutely on point and it's really important that Europe do this before those June elections. Europe really needs has got a very short amount of time to make sure that red lines are set out for Russia and that, you, that Ukraine has as much as it can do now rather than risking not being able to do it later. Um, f some more French stuff here. It's essential that Russian athletes do not feel welcome in France. These are the same words used by Anne Hidalgo. She's, she's a mayor of Paris during her visit to Kiev at the end of March. However, her position differs from that of the French government, which is in line with the IOC doctrine, so the International Olympic Committee, that athletes cannot be held responsible for the actions of the, their leaders. The Ukrainian minister gives his interpretation, quote, we are counting on our French partners not to, own, not to take any decisions that would make it difficult or even impossible for our athletes to take part in Paris. Uh, Ukrainian athletes, that being. Matt Vibidny, the Minister of Sport, is also making sure that Ukraine is closely following the work of the IOC Evaluation Commission, which is responsible for verifying the eligibility of qualified athletes. Quote, My ministry has a database of 800 names of Russian and Belarusian athletes, coaches and sports executives who support the Russian war and propaganda machine. We are providing all this information to the IOC. So it's not... It cu cuts both ways, this one. So the IOC can't say, you can't hold athletes responsible for the decisions of the government and yet allow athletes in who are saying I support what the government is doing and I've actually been part of the war machine as a, as a soldier or part of the armed forces as many of the Russian athletes are or better Russian athletes are so not only do I support the war effort physically in what I do in a day job but I vocally rhetorically support the war effort and I've even done fundraising for the Russian war effort so you can't you can't say right athletes are different from the government and then allowing a bunch of athletes who are essentially on par like part of the government part of the armed forces and advocating everything the government do so it cuts yeah it cuts both ways guys french company still on france danone massive massive uh, corporation this starts dissolution of its last subsidiary in belarus french dairy products company danone mm, danone launched a dissolution of its last subsidiary Danone Bell, um, according to independent Belarusian media. Uh, yeah, it's a long time coming. These things might take just take a long time. Better now than never, uh, I would say. Finland, and, and of course, the food industry is not so much sanctioned as other, other industries concerning Russia and Belarus. Finland decided that the land border crossings between Finland and Russia will remain closed uh, from April the 15th. In addition, the water traffic border crossings at Harpasari uh, and Nujamaya ports and Santio will be closed to pleasure craft traffic from April the 15th. Good stuff. Ukraine's Prime Minister Denis Smihal arrived in Lithuania on April the 5th, so today, to speak to his counterpart. And we've heard of some uh, stuff coming out already in the military aid segment in the previous video. Russia, says Jean Kiev, is not only trying to cause commercial airline disasters in Europe, but now train disasters as well. Meanwhile, Ukrainians were willing to wipe the floor with Russia if merely provided the weapons that are still being withheld. And this is uh, re reacting to the news from the Financial Times that Prague claims thousands of Russian attempts to interfere with EU rail networks. So apparently a uh, Czech government today has said that, that, that Russia is 
in the same way that their cyber warfare efforts have been trying to uh, damage the hospitals in France and there have been attacks, there have been various attacks all over Europe, but the latest one is on the rail uh, sector, which is, as I've said before, that is war. Like, that's the same as dropping a bomb on a railway track. Like, it's functionally the same. You, you stop railways from, from working because you've screwed the, in, uh, the IT infrastructure. It's the same as stopping railways from working from screwing the physical infrastructure. There's no functional difference. That is war. What are we doing about it? Japanese CEO with links to Vladimir Putin's inner circle was found dead in a five-star Moscow hotel. This is the CEO of Yamaha Music, I believe. Uh, was found dead, but he does have links to uh, to Putin. So, you know, there you go. It's not unusual. And staying on Japan, the Japanese government has announced today that it's decided to ban exports of uh, 164 goods to Russia, such as uh, auto engine oil and optical equipment, according to Japanese media. The ban, which will take effect from the 17th, will be implemented as part of Tokyo sanctions against Russia due uh, to its aggressive aggression Sorry, against Ukraine. Good news, Japan. Now, sanctions do cut both ways, talking about cutting both ways already, as I have done. UK intelligence has said that Russia has seized 180 Ukrainian companies worth an estimated 11.5 billion euros since the beginning of the invasion. The report also highlights Russia's redistribution of those assets to Kremlin-aligned business people who support the war in Ukraine. And so the oligarchy is maintained and they are helping themselves to Ukrainian businesses. Well, to be honest, that's what you would expect, given that Ukraine has done similar to Russia. And finally, uh, a plane, here's a plane on a Russian airline, Azure Air, catching fire while trying to take off from uh, Phuket. It happened during the Phuket to Sochi flight. According to Russian media, passengers began to panic. All passengers were evacuated. This is the aviation industry suffering sanctions biting and continuing to do so it's uh, I, as i keep saying or i said a number of times recently i think the screw is turning somewhat on the russian economy on society uh, and i hope it does i hope the ukrainians continue to hit oil refineries and, and military bases and substations as well electricity substations are, are blowing up here here and there and so yeah i hopefully the discontent amongst the uh, Russian population will continue to rise and get to a critical point. Hope can, hope springs eternal though. Anyway, thanks for watching. Please like, subscribe and share. Uh, been a long day. Take care. Speak soon.